the financial centers of the world. This is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Virus versus vaccinations, lockdown strike again in Europe. While the FDA clears Moderna and Pfizer boosters, shots for all adults. Stocks trade mixed money rushing into the bond market. Tesla, 1400. We're going to speak to Dan Ives of Wedbush, is now the biggest bull on Tesla, calling it a leader in the green wave. We're going to speak to Ives on his call. And a historic bill. The House passes Biden's a human infrastructure plan. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is set to speak at any moment. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host, in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Uh, happy Friday. Happy Human Infrastructure Day, Guy. We're still a long way away, though, from this meaningfully yeah. getting into the economy. Well, we're still a long way away from it becoming reality as well. It's still got to go to the Senate, and who knows what's going to happen there. Cinema Mansion, what are they going to do? So, yes, this is a nice... Nice step forward for the president. He's not going to enjoy it because I think he's having a colonoscopy a little bit later on. So the victory <laughs> lap may have to wait, maybe, until tomorrow, his birthday. But nevertheless, it is a big step forward. Uh, what are we, 220-230? My understanding, according to uh, AMH, Ambry Hordern in D.C., is that voting is now done. So we're kind of there. But nevertheless, yeah. I, this is a lot of money. Say this gets done, this is, let's call it 1.6 to 2 trillion that is going to go into the economy at a time when the economy is firing on all cylinders and is starting to exhibit inflationary problems. Yeah, so so I, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, uh, the Journal had an editorial out today that said the actual real cost is going to be anywhere between three and four trillion because some of the programs won't really roll off after a year. So you could see a yep. much, much bigger uh, uh, infusion into the economy to their point. Do we really need $4 trillion? Do we need that kind of multiplier right now? Well, I, I think probably maybe even the Democrats would argue that $4 trillion is a push. And I'm, maybe the fact that that number is not out there is an indication uh, of the fact that they are maybe changing the calculus when it comes to inflation. So that is certainly the thought that we're trying to figure out right now. I think the markets uh, are, are going to wait and see. I think they're going to wait and figure out exactly what the Senate does on this. As I say, we don't know what cinema is going to do. We don't know what Manchin's going to do. But we do know is, and you're looking at the live shot right now, is that the House has passed it. I give, of course, it was meant to go through last night when McCarthy decided that he was going to get up uh, and uh, basically make that not happen so everybody went home. So they came back first thing this morning uh, to get it done. And they have got it done. Let's get the latest now on what is happening in D.C., Amory Hordern, Bloomberg's Washington correspondent, uh, and Katie Koch joining us from Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Katie is the co-head of Fundamental Equity Business uh, over at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Amory, let me start with you. So it's done, but it's not done, mm. and we still don't know what the <laughs> final number is. It's a big hurdle. They cleared a big hurdle today, 220-213, passing of the House. You see Democrats, if you're looking at the floor cam, chanting Build Back Better. They're hugging each other. They're fist pumping. It is a big deal for this party. But as you say, Guy, they are not done because now this means this goes to the Senate. And the Senate is where it's going to be very difficult for the Democrats to really corral on and have a consensus together. They only have 50. They need every single vote. So any single senator, which we've seen happen with Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema, but any single senator can have an issue with a policy or provision and that could potentially block or drag on the talks. Now, Senator Schumer says he wants to get done before Christmas. That timeline is incredibly tight. Yeah. That's all I'll say. They go on vacation in like two seconds. Um, Katie, first of all, thanks for being here on set. Oh. We really appreciate it. It's great to um, be here. So we don't know yet if it's gonna, what's going to make it through the Senate. How are you playing it right now? Yeah, so I, I appreciated the comments before that this could potentially be inflationary at a point in time where the economy is running hot, and I, I agree with that. But at the same time, one of our key theses here is that we are going to make a transition from outright recovery to actually more resilience, and that's a lot of the things reflected in this bill. Um, we do think it eventually passes in some form, and this, as a country, we're going to build more resilience into the planet, into the healthcare system, into the way that millennial families operate, um, and we're very invested in a lot of the trends that have been outlined in this bill, and so our expectation is that it will eventually get through. Katie, but that's short-term, long-term. So, it, yeah, it gets through, we start spending this money, and it starts to have a meaningful impact, and that impact is positive. But that's going to be felt over potentially a, a, a decade. 
right now we have an inflation problem. <sighs> Uh, and, and even if some of this money is going to be spent further down the road, some of it's going to be spent now, do we really need to put extra government spending into the economy right now? I hear what you say about the long-term story, but right now the president's biggest problem is inflation. The economy's biggest problem is inflation. We agree that inflation is an issue, and um, we've been pretty vocal from our equity team saying that um, while a lot of the, the, the macro uh, specialists have said that it's transitory, we've actually seen something really different bottom up from our companies, and they're all struggling with it. So we agree with that. At the same time, I would say that we have a lot of tools to deal with inflation, and I think that's what we're going to see the Fed start to do for the rest of this year. Um, and um, that's how we think it'll probably be handled and addressed through a rising rate cycle. And, and one thing on inflation I'd like to just say yeah. from the, the D.C. point is that clearly the president is now using his economic agenda as a point to say that it's actually going to relieve inflationary pressures. But he's talking about those long-term inflationary uh, uh, pressures. And the CBO score that I'm really looking out for, obviously we have the score for the bill uh, on their analysis, the Congressional Budget Office, but the inflationary impact we will get in January. And I've always wondered when I heard that if this means that some key senators will use that as a way to potentially slow up the process. And key senators, I think of Senator Joe Manchin, who has been for months talking about that he doesn't believe that inflation is quote unquote transitory. And he wrote to Jay Powell in early August saying we're over prescribing our economy. We're over stimulating this patient that is the U.S. recovery. All right. So, Katie, drill, drill deeper here. How mm -hmm. do you hedge inflation right now in an equity portfolio? Well, obviously, equities should, in, in theory, be a natural inflation if you pick the right companies because you want to pick the right companies that can pass on rising costs. And obviously, generally, that's what we're focused on. If we do have a continued background of upward pressure, both on lage, wages, excuse me, as well as inputs, then we want to find the companies that can pass that on to the end consumer. And so we're very focused on those sectors. And then there's other sectors that are actually inflationary beneficiaries. And I would put, I would put commodities, for example, in that space. And we have selective exposure to those commodities, particularly the ones that are going to be used in building back better, like lithium, for example. Katie, do you worry that that rate cycle may have to be put on steroids, that ultimately the Fed's decided it wants to be late when it has to actually pull the trigger and start that rate hiking cycle? It's going to have to do so relatively quickly. Is there a danger that that starts to upend if it goes significantly higher? And some people are talking about 3 4 percent than the market is anticipating currently the rally that we're seeing in equities right now. I, I think this is a risk, obviously, that we could have a policy misstep. We already, have, we, as we've um, identified, we have a strong inflationary backdrop, and we're talking about adding more stimulus to it. As I mentioned, I think it's stimulus that we need to get the country headed in the right direction and to build more resilience into our economy. But there's certainly the possibility that we could have a misstep here, and that rates back up more than the market's currently pricing in. And obviously, there we would see a correction. Uh, we all know markets have gone up a lot, and they also go down. That's the reality and so it is possible that that's ahead of us mm -hmm. um, they do? but we think markets they go down should... yeah. sometimes <laughs> really? they do for you like sure? a second and then the retail guys get Not it often. um and so okay uh, <laughs> katie just one more point on this yeah, and, sure. and just going back to the bill um i should point out that chuck schumer says the senate's going to act on biden's plan as soon as possible mm -hmm. in that plan i know you mentioned sort of lithium we'll get to yeah. that in the next segment is there anything on the human part yeah. that you can actually make investable yeah, so I really liked what um, part of this bill they're talking about um, health care and provision of affordable health care. I, I would say big picture, we have um, the lowest labor force participation rate in this country. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which we can get into later. Um, but one is de barrier has definitely been the lack of affordable daycare um, for, for all Americans and particularly working women. And so we're invested in a company called Bright Horizons, which partners with corporates to provide affordable daycare. Daycare, a burden that falls on women and one of the reasons that the labor force participation rate has been particularly weak amongst women. And so this is a solutions provider to one of those gating factors to labor force participation and women in particular. All right, good stuff. All right, thank you very much, Emery. Thank you. It's been a long day for you, Emery Hordern, joining us from Bloomberg. Uh, Katie's going to stick with us. We want to get uh, your sector calls as well. Because coming up, Tesla shares recently hitting a rough patch after Elon Musk sold some shares. Some bulls, though, don't seem to care. Dan Ives of Wedbush raising his price target to a street high of $1,400. He joins us next. This is Bloomberg.
41 minutes into the session, live from London. I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele over in New York. This is Bloomberg Markets. Let's talk Tesla. Let's talk EVs. The recent drop in Tesla shares not changing Wedbush's view of the stock. The firm raising its price target from 1100 to 1400 reiterating its outperform rating. Apparently, there's a, a bull case here, which is 1800 Let's join now the analyst that made that call. He is, of course, Dan Ives, Wedbush Securities equity strategist covering Tesla, the EV space. Dan, what gets you to 1400 What gets you to 1800 Well, it's China. I mean, right now, I think the China story, that's worth $400 a share to Tesla. You're seeing an acceleration, not just in China, but globally as part of this green tidal wave. I think for Tesla, this is a company that could do 1.4, 1.5 million units next year. On these margins, it's why we raised the price target. And you talk about the bull case, that still does not include FSD, robo-taxis, and others, which could be incremental. So, uh, Dan... Does this mean that, like, the likes of Rivian, for example, or Lucid or Neo, like, they're not going to go anywhere? Or is there room for all of this in the, in the EV pie? Well, it's a $5 trillion market over the next decade. And, you know, that's why what you're seeing with a lot of these EV stocks continuing to go up because this is the biggest transformation to the auto industry since 1950s. I think half that pie is Tesla, $2.5 trillion. The other two and a half, that's going to be up for grabs for the likes of a GM, Ford, VW, a Lucid, a Rivian, and others. And that's when investors are playing here in terms of who those winners are as part of just this massive jump ball in the auto industry. Dan, we've just seen Build Back Better passed in the House. We've obviously got the infrastructure bill. That looks like it's going to go through. Um, how big a part of the puzzle, the, the kind of the conundrum here relating to how quickly we can make this EV story works depends on that infrastructure money being spent, depends on the U.S. catching up. Range anxiety remains a real worry for many potential EV buyers. Yeah, it's a great question. And U.S. has lagged, clearly China, which is over 10% of EVs, and in Europe as well. I think this is a watershed event in terms of the bill because it, it leads the seeds to what's going to be much more infrastructure building around charging stations, need to get to 500,000 charging stations by the end of the decade, only 100,000 today, as well as just grid upgrades and others. And I think this is just that first step. Today, 2% of automobiles are EVs in the U.S. We think by 25, that's going to be 10% and 25% by 2030. Hey, Dan, Apple is apparently working on its Apple car, looking at a fully autonomous vehicle in just a few years. Is Apple going to eat Tesla? Well, look, I think for Apple, it's a matter of when, not if, they get on the Apple car. Uh, we view that as anywhere from 2020 to 2025, and I think the, the report yesterday confirms what we believe is going to happen. Now, it's not a zero-sum game, so we don't view Apple getting it as necessarily a killer for any of the other names like a GM Ford but it speaks to this massive market opportunity. And we also think there's an 85% chance that Apple could partner with the likes of a VW or the, or the likes of a Lucid or Ford or a GM in, in terms of that rather than doing it themselves. All right, Dan, thanks a lot. Really appreciate you uh, jumping on with us. Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities. Katie Koch of Goldman Sachs Asset Management still with me as well. All right, so we got that $1,400 price target for Tesla. Do you play Tesla? Do you just play the EV sector? What do you do? Uh, we love the EV sector. So, you know, right now about 5% of auto sales are in EV, but it, as Dan articulated, and I think it's really important for people to focus on this, we're at an inflection point of exponential growth. And a lot of the things that are happening in the market right now is the market trying to price that, which is actually really difficult to do. Um, but it is a, a, a really a, an incredible inflection point. And the bill is going to help this because what we're seeing is cost curves inflect. And when that happens, that's when you get explosive innovation and explosive explosive growth. And the cost curves, just to put that into context for people, we're now almost at cost parity between a traditional ICE and an electric vehicle. Um, in fact, the battery price has gone down by 90% since 2010. So taking a step back, like how do you play this space? Uh, we obviously talked about the pure play EV companies. We have some exposure to that. The second area to look would be the OEM, so the traditional auto companies. Can they actually transition to take market share here? This is going to be really difficult. We've picked one person we think, one company we think is going to win there, which is GM. Um, but it is a very difficult thing to reinvent your business. Uh, the third would be the existing tech platforms 
Amazon's getting into the space. You mentioned Apple, Google's doing it too. This is smart for them because they are the tech titans and uh, history shows it's unlikely that they'll keep that hegemony over the next 20 years. So they have to tap into an exponential growth opportunity. Maybe this is it. It's a little tough because it's diluted. You can't, when you buy those companies, you're not getting a lot of EV exposure. The fourth area that we would say we're most excited about is actually the supply chain because it doesn't matter who wins. As Dan just articulated, it's a little bit complicated to figure out who's going to be the big winner. Yes, have exposure to some of those, but the, we know the unambiguous winner is going to be people supplying in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And so we like um, Aptiv, which makes the electrical wiring for, for the vehicles. Uh, we like Wolf Speed, which is one of the semi uh, providers. They uh, And then the third area, I would say, is a company called NIDAC, which is Japanese, but it makes the small motors used in a lot of these vehicles. Katie, are you suggesting the, the big traditional OEMs don't survive. You talk about GM surviving. Rivian's worth what it was earlier this week, worth more than Volkswagen. Like, is that an indication of the future? Does Volkswagen cease to exist? Um, I, I wouldn't. I think that what you're going to see is what you see when you have disruption in, in, in any sector, which is that there are going to be some winners. And right now, we believe that GM is the best positioned um, of them, and that's where we have our capital allocated. And then there, there may be a few that are not able to reinvent themselves as much. Um, I don't have as strong of a view on that, just to say that you're going to have to be highly selective in this space. And so we're more focused on who could reinvent themselves and come out the other side. And for us, that's, that's GM. Um, by the way, a great book for people to read that want to educate themselves on what happens in this space would be Clay Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma and how difficult it is for these incumbent businesses mm -hmm. to continue to run the old business but disrupt that and get into a, a brand new market. Yeah, to see what's happening to some of the oil companies too as they're trying to do the green transition. Absolutely. Um, okay, part of all of this also mm -hmm. has to do with chips. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the traditional OEMs are trying to now make their own chips mm -hmm. like a Ford. Yeah. How do you play that trend, particularly around the supply shortage? Yeah, I think the what's happening in chips right now and in the, the semi industry industry generally is, is very, very interesting. Um, we clearly have major supply chain issues broadly, um, but in the semi industry specifically, we're at a record high in terms of from when we put an order to when you get a chip delivered, uh, 22 weeks, and that's for a basic chip. It's even longer for the leading edge. And so this country has, and, and I think Wall Street's a little guilty for pushing us in this direction. We focus too much on optimization of supply chain and not as much on resilience of supply chain. That's obviously why part of this is a focus of the, the bill that's in the process of being passed right now. And so what we think is going to happen in the semi space for EVs, for 5G, for other technologies that are very foundational to future growth is that we're going to have to reshore parts of that supply chain back to the U.S. And so, yes, we like the front end semi companies like a Marvell, for example, which is leading edge of 5G. But we're actually very interested also in the semi equipment manufacturing companies um, and some of the industrial gas companies that are being used to, to manufacture chips. Yep. We expect more of that to happen in the U.S. Um, 50 15% of U.S. GDP roughly runs through the factory floors in Asia. And that's a vulnerability for this country, which we expect to get addressed. Uh, and one of the reasons why that vulnerability has been highlighted is as a result of COVID. Katie, mm -hmm. we're seeing countries in Europe going into lockdown. Austria today, Germany potentially tomorrow. Uh, you've got cases building in places like Vermont and New Hampshire, the Great Lakes area apparently as well. Mm -hmm. How much of an eye are you keeping on this? What do you think you need to do in terms of positioning the portfolio if we are going to see another winter surge? Yeah, I think this is, of course, a, a real risk. And we've said for a long time, we're going to have to continue to work through a lot of the pressures from this pandemic. We already know what the obvious path to solving a lot of this, which is increasing vaccination rates in this country and around the world. So that's obviously one path we're focused on and invested in the companies that are going to drive that vaccination. Um, and then we also need to build prophylactics because we know that people who are vaccinated are actually still able to transmit the disease. And we need to address that, too. Um, so we think, you you know, it is going to be a couple of years until we get this fully under control. What I would say, though, is that we're not going to see the stop uh, in GDP that we saw in the first quarter of 2020 again, because we actually have more tools to address it from a healthcare system perspective, but also more business resilience um, to address it and an easier ability to go from, to, to a flexible work arrangement, for example, across a lot of industries. So while there'll be some disruption and we have to be prepared for that, we're not gonna see that the stoppage that we saw in the first quarter. So I feel like before you bought RVs and then you were buying some yeah. swimming pool makers, <laughs> would you buy like hotels and airlines now based on like it's not gonna be a full stop 
or do you still like the sw swimming pools and RVs? We, we, we do like still like swimming. Very big picture, we love the millennial consumer. The millennial consumer um, likes experiences over things, so pools and the great outdoors, including RVs, would kind of be in the experience bucket. Maybe I'll give you a new idea today. The other thing that we like, which is connected to working from home and working at work, is the footwear space. Um, and so we are have an overweight in, um, in sneakers, I guess would be the best way to say that, as well as Crocs. So we own Crocs. We own On Running, which is a Swiss company that makes um, uh, running shoes, light, light running shoes. Um, we own Allbirds and we own Deckers, which make both Uggs as well as the Hoka running shoe. So this is a play on the millennial preference for uh, an active lifestyle. Yep. And it's also a view um, that people are, while they've given up their sweatpants and coming back to work, if you looked at the feet of all the people coming into the Goldman Sachs office, they're wearing a lot of, um, a lot of athletic footwear. I don't know what you're wearing, Guy, now, but maybe you're, are you, are you in well, sneakers? I, I, the, the, the tr uh, not yet, uh, maybe later. Um, <laughs> But, He's but not the, a millennial, the trend... let's be very clear. <laughs> Oi. Um, but apparently the big thing in London now is, because yeah. over here wearing brown shoes has been completely anathema. You've never been able to wear brown shoes in the city of London. Apparently that is now acceptable. So we're kind of inching forwards. You guys yeah. are making huge strides forward. You've got to get into those but shoes. Being... You want to project activity and that you're on the leading edge yeah. and you're out there <laughs> doing stuff. He, so. really, he really doesn't <laughs> want to do that. I, I really hope nobody's <laughs> going to take a shot of my feet right now. You're definitely talking <laughs> Alex's language, though. There you go. You're in the wrong no shoes. Yet. You are against my I'm investment a... thesis. <laughs> OK. Well, next time you come back, I'm going to have no tie and I'm going to have sneakers on. All right. Never going to happen. See what the boss says about that. Never going to happen. <laughs> we'll see. You never know. Things are changing. Katie, it's great to see you. It was awesome always to be bringing, here. Always Always bring, well, nice to see you in the studio and, and bringing fashion advice as well as investment advice. What more can I ask for? Katie Koch, Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Thank you very much indeed. What's next? ETF Friday. This is Bloomberg. ETF Friday. Let's talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin seeing signs of support after falling nearly 20%. Dave Wilson is here to tell us more. Well, Guy, you've definitely got support in the Bitcoin futures ETF market. Now, we got to say, a month ago we were talking about five of these funds coming out. Only three actually made it, and the latest was Van Eck this week. Uh, you had ProShares and Bakery. ProShares clearly is the winner uh, in terms of assets. They were at $1.4 billion. They've managed to have inflows almost every day since they started trading last month. And you know, now it's gotten to the point where you've got a new Global X fund that is combining investments in blockchain shares and Bitcoin futures. So, you know, there, there's plenty of support. All right, Dave, cool. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Bloomberg's Dave Wilson joining us there. Coming up, we are set for the most expensive Thanksgiving ever. We're going to talk to the CEO of National Grocers Association president. This is Bloomberg. So we're now into the session on Wall Street. What do we need to know? Alex, the, the story out of Austria, I think, spooked a lot of people first thing this morning. The fact that it's going back into lockdown, maybe starting to raise fears that this is going to happen, not only in Europe, but potentially over in the United States. But at the moment, like the S&P is only down one-tenth of one percent. European equities are definitely off a little bit more. Volume's reasonably OK today, but definitely kind of Europe, peripheral Europe, under a bit of pressure here. But I think it's, it's kind of like what is down versus up. So on the downside, it's energy, financials, yep. and industrials. It's all the cyclical guys that would benefit uh, with higher yields and any kind of reopening and travel, right? That's going to put the kibosh on it. You don't even know if you're going to get to take your uh, Christmas holiday, which you will not be happy about. At the same time, you're seeing money definitely flow into the bond market. Uh, you're seeing very strong buying in the front end of the curve. Yields down by about five yep. basis points. All that pointing to maybe the central banks now are going to have to ease off. Uh, and those uh, maybe price hikes get priced out in some kind of capacity. On the flip side, and I mentioned this earlier, Guy, Moderna, Pfizer, those stocks up really strongly because of the boosters. Yep. Yeah, and, and you can understand that there is going to be an increased need for potentially those boosters as well. So mm -hmm. you need to certainly pay attention to that. Um, it, it is interesting, though, if you think of, is this, 
Will this exacerbate the inflationary story or will this ease the inflation? Oil is down. So that is a factor that's worth thinking about in terms of what the president's been looking for. The president's been super worried about what's been happening with gas prices. Mm -hmm. They are going to certainly start to nose off fairly quickly if this oil move that we're seeing in Brent continues lower because Brent, gasoline, that's the, that's the link. Um, but, but if we do see more COVID cases, more lockdowns, is that going to exacerbate the supply chain problem that we have at the moment that is so inflationary? Or is the demand, is demand going to drop and therefore that removes some of the impetus? I don't know, mm -hmm. but it's going to be really interesting to see how the market kind of deals with this one. But I do think it's interesting. I think Japan's a good example. Um, they unveiled extra stimulus. They're just basically just starting to write checks with people who make under a certain amount. Uh, as part of a stimulus bill to help after the pandemic. We were there like a year ago, and Japan is still there. Um, that would imply that we're going to see that consumer demand sort of continue if we use that as a microcosm. Yep. On the flip side, if you're dealing with hybrid or local lo lockdowns or a whole country-wide lockdown, again, the waiters, for example, the bartenders, they don't need to go to work. So that's going to take away any sort of price uh, pressure and wage pressure that we might have seen there. Yeah, I, I agree. There, there's definitely two ways of looking at this. Um, but if you think about the, 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 the impact last time was we ordered more stuff, right? Yeah. We didn't use services. And I appreciate what you're saying about the waiters and the labor shortages. And that's where certainly an area uh, is certainly an area that we need to focus on. But we ordered more stuff last time. We already know that, that we're already backed up when it comes to buying stuff. There's, not a, there's tons of it on the water. It can't get in. So I'm wondering if we were to revert to that behavior, mm -hmm. whether that would only exacerbate the issue further. Yep. And it's already hard enough now. We're just coming up the holidays, Thanksgiving and then uh, Christmas here in the U.S. And, yep. well, and you guys too. But uh, everything is so expensive. <laughs> Uh, that's a big part of it. Uh, all food, particularly where you are. Your Christmas turkey is going to definitely cost a lot. Um, on that point, Cargill's CEO uh, spoke at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore earlier this week. And he focused on a panel about feeding the world and talked about these price pressures on food producers. The food and ag system has proven to be very resilient, perhaps surprisingly resilient. I think it underscores the importance and the benefits of an interconnected food supply system. So we've been able to get food from where it's produced to where it's needed, with some exceptions. There have been spot shortages. There's been dis disruptions. But we are seeing food prices starting to pick up. While McLennan says the industry has been resilient, you can see with this chart here, and this is the, the UN Food and Agriculture World uh, food price index, plus also the Bloomberg index, that, that prices have picked up and pricked, uh, picked up really quite sharply. You think about why um, gas prices go up, natural gas prices go up, that feeds into fertilizer. Fertilizer is more expensive. John Deere just had a strike because of labor. That means the tractors, the, the latest kit, not available. That is another issue for farmers. This stuff is heavy. It needs to be moved around the world. That's, again, a problem because fuel prices are high and there's a shortage of drivers and there's a shortage of ships. So all of this kind of comes together and you can see that pickup that we've seen in food prices. It is absolutely enormous. The question is, does it continue and is it going to be manageable? Gregory Ferreira, National Grocers Association president and CEO, joining us now. His group represents uh, 2,100 grocers, grocery stores around the world. Sorry, 21,000 grocery stores around the United States. Gregory, thanks for your time today. Food prices are going up. We're about to hit Thanksgiving. Just give us a sense of what supermarket shelves look like right now. Do they have everything on them? And how much are the prices going up? Yeah, good morning. It's great to be with you today. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing, uh, you know, businesses ticked up the significantly ahead of the holiday season in our member stores. The good news is, overall, uh, we're in pretty good shape uh, uh, in store shelves. Occasionally, you're going to find that item that might be out of uh, stock on the Tuesday when you're in the store. If you're back there on a Wednesday or Thursday, we'll probably have it back on the shelf. And that's just really tied up not in a production issue, not in availability of food, but it's getting the product from the manufacturer, from the distribution center to the store. And that could be uh, certainly a bit of a challenge. You mentioned about food prices. We obviously have seen uh, the impact of inflation in our industry as well. The good news is uh, the supermarket industry is really one of the most competitive industries there, uh, there is. And our members are working really hard to ensure that the customers coming in the stores are going to still find great deals, great prices, and uh, be able to find those items they need for their holidays. So. so the produce that you guys buy, does that wind up crimping margins if you're still trying to be, stay really competitive? 
Yeah, absolutely. It'll have an impact on, on margins. Uh, inherently, the supermarket industry, particularly independent supermarket industry, is a, a fairly low margin business, uh, on average, uh, less than 2% net profit. Uh, so we need to sell a lot of items and we need to uh, make sure we're being very competitive so we can uh, have uh, show value to those customers who are coming in our member stores. Uh, but they are going to see some of that be passed on. The reality is when uh, we're seeing cost increase uh, coming down the supply chain, you can't absorb everything. And uh, so some of that is going to be passed on. And therefore, our members will continue to look at how do we really make sure there are good deals, good sales, and good value for the customers coming in the store to help them out. Gregory, where are the biggest bottlenecks? Where are the biggest shortages? Uh, are apples going up versus oranges? Frozen goods uh, versus non-frozen goods? Just give me a sense of kind of where the, the real pain points are in terms of prices rising. You know, I think it's, it, it's spread across all the different departments in the store. Certainly, we've seen it uh, in the meat department. We're seeing it in center stores, so that's dry grocery type items. Uh, but we're likely to, you know, to see it across most, most of the departments in the store. A lot of this is being driven, quite frankly, by an acute labor shortage throughout the whole supply chain, and particularly a, a trucker shortage. Now, we've been short truck drivers for a number of years now. Uh, that certainly wasn't uh, it was an issue that we had before the pandemic, but the pandemic has really exasperated that issue mm -hmm. uh, and made it more acute. So when there's uh, certainly the, the increased demand in our member stores and there's uh, you know less truckers, there's less labor to get it there, that absolutely is going to impact price. Yeah, what about in the store, though? So you mentioned the labor being an issue and the backup in terms of the transportation, for example. Um, there's no shortage of a produce in the store, but what about the workers to put it on the shelves? Yeah, look, we're, our, our members, are, I would say every single one of them have uh, help wanted signs uh, out front of their stores right now. Uh, they are certainly working to get more people in the stores. Look, not only um, have they remained open during the pandemic, and I think have done a great job of taking care of their frontline workers. We call them supermarket superheroes because they really are. Um, but we, we need, uh, with this increased business, particularly going into the holidays, it's going to be important that we've got enough labor to be able to serve those customers. So our members are doing some other things as well, right? They're employing technology. They're employing uh, a mix of self-checkout and full-service full checkout and redeploying uh, uh, workers throughout the store so that those workers are really in areas that are customer facing and can make sure they're serving those customers in the best way possible. What happens after Thanksgiving? What happens after Christmas? What does the new year look like? So, you know, what we're hearing is, is Q1. We're going to continue to, uh, to experience inflation. Uh, our, we're hearing from the supply chain and uh, that we're going to likely to continue to get some price increases into Q1. I think a lot of it depends on what happens, right? Um, if we continue to have success with vaccines, we continue to have success with COVID in the United States, we will likely see an uptick in cases, but hospitalizations have been fairly steady. We're seeing therapeutics. Uh, you know, come out into the marketplace. Boosters mm -hmm. are now available for folks. And so I think that, you know, we're going to continue to see some pressures, but hopefully we continue to move in the right direction uh, well, here in the U.S. Before we let you go, Gregory, I just want to get your take on that because we're seeing renewed lockdowns over in Europe and we are seeing cases rise in certain areas in the U.S., particularly now focused on the Midwest. Um, your members, are they doing anything differently? Are they having to shut some stores, limit hours, do different requirements? No, for the most part, it's business as usual. Look, we've had safety pr uh, protocols and protections that have been in place from day one. We've leaned in. We've been ahead of government and quite often in a lot of areas in protecting our employees. That's what we will continue to do. Uh, we're not anticipating seeing any lockdowns. We just need to continue to focus on vaccinations and making sure that we're taking care of our communities, and we'll be there for them. All right, Gregory, thanks a lot. We really appreciate you spending this time with us. Uh, Gregory Ferreira, uh, National Grocer Association President and CEO. All right, coming up, we were talking about it earlier. The EV revolution is bound to change the way that we drive and travel. So we're going to talk with the CEO of an auto tech startup about how we'll adapt to that EV world. Richard Barlow, a WeJo CEO and founder, is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Uh, Dr. Stephen Corrin coming up. That New York Presbyterian Hospital CEO will be joining Bloomberg at 12 p.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
checking now on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Alex Steele. President Biden will briefly turn over power to Vice President Kamala Harris today. That will happen when the president is under anesthesia. I actually cannot say that word while undergoing a colonoscopy at Walter Reed Medical Center. The White House says George W. Bush followed the same process twice during his presidency. The infrastructure bill that President Biden signed into law could end up saving lives. The legislation calls for requirements that new cars will be equipped with whatever tech new technology best prevents drunk driving deaths. There are also calls for regulations involving other safety technology like automatic emergency braking. And that is your first word news, Guy. Hugh. Crushed it. Hugh. Alex, Just well done. Hugh mocking. Yeah. Go. I actually, my husband and I spend a very long time getting you to try and say that word, anesthesia, and I actually, I, I literally can't do it. Anesthesia. Can't do it. An anesthesia. Okay. Anest yeah. It's, it, it's tough. It, it, you look at it on, on an anesthesia. auto cue, it's not the, the, the easiest word to say, but, wow, but you managed so nice to work your you. way Thank through you. it. Thank you. No, that, that wasn't nice of me. That was me being British. <laughs> Got to decipher this one. <laughs> so much mocking. Understand. But well-deserved. Yeah. Well-deserved, really, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really tank that word, so fair enough. If, you, if you're going if you're gonna to take the mickey out of my shoes, you are going to get something back, I tell you. <laughs> anyway, let's park that for the moment, and I use that word operatively. Joining us now is someone who helps develop IT solutions for safety on roads, uh, Richard Barlow. Weijo, CEO and founder. Now, the company collects data from 11.9 million vehicles and basically converts it into insights about what is happening with road traffic conditions, accident black spots, uh, health of cars. I, we all increasingly use this technology. I would certainly do pretty much everywhere I go. I haven't picked up a map in a very long time. It's gone public today via a SPAC. Uh, Richard, um, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We really appreciate it. First of all, let's just, let's just deal with the, kind of the mechanics of the SPAC. Why did you go this way? What difference is it going to make? What are you going to do with the money? Well, access to capital uh, on a gross basis. We now have access to over $225 million. Uh, we have huge automotive manufacturer demand to, to roll out products in Japan, the whole of APAC, the whole of Europe, um, beyond in the US. We've, we've operated in the US for the last three, four years. So this, this gives us, that, this enables us to supercharge our business. With the backing we've now got from Microsoft and Palantir, we, we, we're already the market leader in the US. We intend to be market leader globally. Um, uh, on a real time look right now, are people moving around right now? What can you tell us? Right now, I can see from less than a minute ago, 7% of vehicles moving around New York, 12% in Austin. We hmm. receive over 450,000 data points every second. So less than a minute, so we can see intersections, we can see traffic light changes. All the trend basis, so there's um, so very much the consumers in control, the drivers in control about what they share with us. But we we're helping cities be safer. We're helping reduce emissions in cities. We're helping reduce congestion in real time. One of our key map partners is Microsoft. We're helping them improve their mapping product. In terms of what's going to happen next, like this feels like it's been EV week. Uh, we've not only had the kind of whole story around Rivian, Lucid, et cetera, and the share price gains and losses that we've seen. We've also seen the infrastructure bill going through. That's going to be huge for the United States, and it's certainly going to turbocharge. We've used turbocharge. We've now used supercharge um, in, in terms of what is going to happen. What, what is the impact of this going to be, do you think, on mobility in the United States, the acceleration of the EV story, and what does it mean for your business? Yeah, I mean, the infrastructure bill includes an $8 billion budget to install charging points. We're working with motor manufacturers, we're working with utilities companies to establish where to install these EV charging points. We actually ran a hackathon a couple of weeks ago at Palantir, uh, and we one of, one of our use cases we came, came up with is how we can in real time now establish where are EVs parking, what is the battery level, where are yep. they going home to? So we're, we're helping install in a real-time environment now where should EV chargers be installed, which has fundamentally changed since, since COVID has changed the profile of driving. Who do you work with on that? How, how, how does that come up from the data to execution? So we get live data from vehicle with consent of the driver. So we understand the battery life. We understand battery temperature in some environments. We understand the temperature outside. So for example, Charging an EV in Alaska is different to charging an EV in Texas. There's a fundamentally different performance of the battery life. So, and we've got partners like Heller. Heller are a six billion euro tier one manufacturer. They, they, they're a big EV manufacturer. We're helping them make more informed decisions. We're helping with partners like Palantir help inform the, the whole utility sector. In terms of 
kind of how this process is going to accelerate. Um, we've had Apple today talking about the fact that it thinks that it can produce uh, a fully autonomous vehicle by 2025. I, that sounds like a stretch to me, but nevertheless, how, how is your data going to make that step possible? I, communication is going to be absolutely critical. G extremely granular data is going to be absolutely critical. What have you got that is going to help that process? So we've machine learned every lane of every highway. We've machine learned to three, to three meter accuracy from the 11.9 million vehicles on platform we get data from in a real time environment. We've received over 477 billion miles of data. That's 20 times more than Tesla, uh, 20 times more than Alphabet's Waymo. So we've got a huge data asset and we're machine learning all the time the outcomes. We're helping most manufacturers already design parking utilities where an AV, an autonomous vehicle, will know where to park once, once it drops the, the driver off. It will it'll then inform other AVs in the area as to where, where they could then park. So there's going to be a huge number of infrastructure requirements and data requirements, and we just positioned with a huge data asset already built and adding to, a, um, and we, we're becoming a central component of the, of the AV industry and the EV industry. Wow, very cool. Richard, thanks a lot. We really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Congrats on the SPAC. Uh, Richard Barlow, uh, we do, founder and CEO. Breaking news for you, Federal Reserve Governor Chris Wallace uh, saying he favors a faster taper on jobs games. Mike McKee is here with the latest. Mike, you are seeing sort of yields come off the lows of the session on the front end from this. What did we learn? Well, it's a little interesting because uh, we haven't had a Fed governor dissent since 2005. So while they're taking a very strong position here may indicate that we're beginning to see some movement on the Fed towards that faster taper. Here's Waller's key quote. For my part, the rapid improvement in the labor market and the deteriorating situation, uh, deteriorating inflation data have pushed me towards favoring a faster pace of tapering and a more rapid removal of accommodation in 2022. Now you could read the last phrase as maybe starting rate increases because as long as you are still adding to the balance sheet uh, you're not removing accommodation so at this point uh, it is an interesting development uh, that he is speaking out so firmly but of course a lot's going to depend on who's with him on the fed when we get to next year yep and potentially this has the um effect of bringing forward the opportunity to raise rates as well the whole time change the whole time sequencing starts to change. Mike, thanks very much indeed. Uh, it's going to be a busy week next week. We are going to hear from, from a lot of Fed speakers. A ton of Fed speak next week. This is Bloomberg. Friday and the guy and I are here. We label and look at the best charts of the week. Uh, ver uh, not versus, not a competition. Okay, this is mine and this is tech. Uh, guy, <laughs> you're getting hit on the down the S&P today, but tech is holding up well. And this kind of is a very interesting non-explanation. So this blue line here is the percentage of members in the NASDAQ 100 that's below its 50-day moving average. That's rolling over at the same time. You have the NASDAQ 100 continuing uh, to move higher. So that divergence is quite interesting, but a large part of this white line is Apple and Tesla. You take those out, and you're going to have the rally that we've seen in that index uh, since the beginning of November. So it feels like we're back to that kind of theme. Those large cap fang tech stocks are moving the, are moving the needle. Yep, absolutely. Um, it is EV week, so you have to roll that in. So nice to get that, uh, that little element uh, within that too. Um, I'm going to talk about the euro. I'm going to talk about this chart here, friends with benefits. So the euro is down, what, year to date? 8%. We're, we're down at a 16-month low. Um, clearly, one of the factors that we are watching here is the divergence between the ECB and the Fed. But it'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, the pickup in COVID we're seeing drives the euro down even further. But there's obviously an effect, and we're starting to see it spilling over. Think about what this could mean for Europe. So this chart here basically models uh, the euro area exporters and the euro area domestic stocks. The blue line is the domestic stocks. They've been doing better as the recovery has started to kick into gear. The exporters have done less well. They've done OK, but less well uh, than the domestic stocks. Now, what you could see is that being completely flipped on its head, Alex, 
as a result of this weaker euro uh, because it'll give the opportunity for the exporters to do a little bit better. Uh, think about what is happening in the healthcare sector, which is huge, obviously, across Europe. The luxury sector, massive impact in France. That could have a huge benefit in terms uh, of the impact of the Cancaron. So think about those exporters and how they could benefit from this if the euro continues to weaken from here. Mm -hmm. We've come all the way down. We're kind of circa 113 right now. Some people are talking about a move to 110. Yeah, I've seen a lot of calls for next year for 110 or even below a UBS, Deutsche Bank, for example. But I have to wonder what point, Guy, does the weak euro become a negative because it's actually a growth scare, a lockdown scare uh, versus just a central bank divergence? Well, that's the, I think that's the story we're now going to try and calculate, isn't it? We've watched what has happened here in terms of the pickup in cases over the last few days. We've seen the Austrian lockdown today. Will Germany now follow? I think that's the question mm -hmm. people are trying to ask themselves. We're going to try and answer that next. The European close is coming up. We've got just the person to talk to. Rasmus Beck Hansen, Affinity CEO, joining us next. He's the guy you want to talk to about modelling this data. He'll be joining us very shortly. This is Bloomberg.